Good morning. good morning, and good morning to those of you at home as well. My name is Matt Hadley, and I'm the senior pastor here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, and what a joy it is to gather together, whether here in person or at home, to worship our God on this Palm Sunday, a day in which we all join our voices and shout Hosanna. So on the count of three, don't shout, but just let's say the word, and I want you at home to say it with us as well. One, two, three. Hosanna, Hosanna, what great news it is. Thank you for your registration, for being here with us, and for those of you at home who are still feeling not quite safe enough yet, maybe you haven't had a second shot and had the two weeks uh, time after that, I'm so glad that we do have this technology to still stay connected as a community of faith, no matter what worship may look like. For those of you at home, we do continue to take our prayer life very seriously here. And so you're invited to text in uh, to 414-331-2691, any items of joy or concern you may have. And for those of you here in-house, that number is also uh, up on the screen right now, but it's also on your card. And so if you want to have your prayers heard, we would love to receive them. As the service, when the service concludes, you're going to be invited, you'll be escorted out, and you're invited to place these cards and any kind of offering that you may have into our offering box, and we'll let that sit for a, a couple of days, and then we will process it. Thank you for the ways in which you continue to support our community of faith. And some have said, well, what about uh, the children's ministry? You know, children's ministry, as long as everything continues on the path that we're on, is going to be up and running again in person in May. But in the meantime, we still want to be faithful to our children. And so we're actually going to hear our gospel lesson for this day uh, from uh, Reverend Andrew Jones with the children. Let's receive this video children's message. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden, Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying that colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people started to spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! Welcome, Jesus! Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna, welcome Jesus. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Ho, 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 Hosanna. Ha, ha, hallelujah. He, 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 he saved me. I've got the joy of the Lord.
let us join our hearts together, whether we're here in the sanctuary or at home, and be in an attitude of prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And let us join now in a time of silent and listening prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, who comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, you are not the savior we expect. Your power doesn't look like the power we want. Your wisdom often seems foolish to us. Oh, we are happy to join the crowd waving branches, but we're not ready to follow you into the temple court, into the upper room, into the garden of Gethsemane, all the way to the cross. Forgive our foolish assumptions, O Lord. Clarify our clouded vision. Hear us as we cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Show us your salvation. We thank you, Lord, for knowing the troubles and pains we face in this earthly life and for offering us healing and hope. Help us to model our lives on your life of self-giving and sacrifice. For in giving, we know we will receive, and the joy of giving will be multiplied as we expand our reach near and far. Now, O oh Lord, hear prayers from our congregation for people in difficult places or times in their lives, and for those who are celebrating special joys. We lift up a prayer of thanks and praise for the birth of Nell and Randy Nash's granddaughter, Nira. Prayers for a cousin who will have brain surgery tomorrow. Prayers for Natalie Hatch and her upcoming brain surgery this week. May the doctors be the hands of Jesus as they heal this mother, wife, daughter, and faithful servant of the Lord. Prayers of recovery for a nephew who's in an induced coma and prayers for a good biopsy outcome for a sister. We pray for Pastor Janet's family, her cousins, John and Linda and Stephen, will be talking about palliative care today regarding Deborah's condition. Difficult decisions must be made. Gloria asks for prayers for her nephew, Michael, who went to the ER with a drug overdose. Prayers for strength and resilience this week. And a prayer for Phil, recovering from a broken arm after five surgeries in the past year. Prayers for mental health. And for a friend with a 17-year-old son diagnosed with leukemia. These are the prayers of our people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. By the power of your spirit, lead people of faith everywhere to witness to your truth and proclaim that death does not have the last word, not in our lives, in the church, or in the world. Bless us throughout this holy week and keep us ever faithful to the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Holy Week begins, we remember how Jesus continued to give of himself even as the cross loomed ever closer. May we also be inspired to give for the sake of others through our tithes and offerings and through special gifts that we make to mission every month. In March, the mission we have supported is UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, which is our denomination's first responder agency wherever natural disasters, major events that require help for people occur around the world. In the month of April, as we look ahead, we will be supporting the Cathedral Center in downtown Milwaukee. The Cathedral Center is an agency that exists to provide a safe environment for women and families while working to end homelessness. Your mission donations in April are going to support shelter and basic needs and life-changing case management services for the 1,000 women and families that they serve each year. There is a video on, uh, available for you to see to get more details about the Cathedral Center. There will be a link to that video in the weekly eJoy, and uh, I invite you to check it out. If you don't get a weekly eJoy, I believe every Wednesday, this is something you'd want to be getting to be aware of what's going on in the life of the church. So please let Anne in the office know if you're not on that list, and she will put you on that list. There are a variety of ways that you can make your gifts, of course. If you're here today, as Matt said, you can leave them in the box down front. If you are at home or if you wish to give later, you may send your offerings to the church office or you can text to, uh, to make a gift or go to our website to give online. As always, please designate if your offering is for a mission offering rather than your regular offerings. That's the who and the what of our offering information for today and the how that you've already gotten as well. So I invite you to uh, take some time now to reflect on your giving and to uh, dedicate our, our gifts by praying. Lord Jesus, with all our gifts, we give you glory. We give you laud, we give your honor. We give thanks for your generous, humble spirit and we ask that you bless these offerings so that all who benefit from them may see in them your love. Amen. and blossoms gay are strewn this day in festal preparation where Jesus comes to wipe our tears away in all the throng to welcome him prepare And peoples by its might, one 
once more we gain freedom from degradation. Humanity doth give to each his right, while those in darkness find restored the light. We continue our worship now with a reading from Psalm 118. These verses contain some of the most familiar words in all of scripture, words that have been uttered by Jews and Christians in worship since they were first uttered over 2,000 years ago. Listen as these words affirm and celebrate the deliverance that comes by God's steadfast love. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Lord. 
in church. That felt pretty good to, to, to just witness and to be a part of. We have been in this journey, this journey that we call Lent, an entire season of preparation, preparing ourselves for what comes next week, but we're, we're not there yet. There's still some things that, that have to happen. And so we've been in this sermon series called Crosswalk as we're getting closer and closer to the actual cross, and that walk is certainly going to intensify here this week. But today, we get to shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And we've been able to wave our palm branches here in the sanctuary. And if you are at home and, and you didn't get a palm, we're going to leave some out on Silver Spring. Come by and take a palm so that you can have it at home and, and remember that you are called by God and saved by our God. But let me pause for just a brief prayer. Dear God, your son came to the city this day and people received him joyfully. So may we receive him. As he came humbly, so come to us with grace and mercy and forgiveness. As he came in strength, challenge us with a new vision of our city, our nation, our world. As he startled his friends and onlookers, so startle us again, O God, with your urgent love for us and for the world which you have created and ultimately redeemed. In the name of this Christ, amen. Well, typically, you know, non-pandemic times, uh, this week is a really, really big week in worship. And, you know, I just, I miss having the, all the children come down with all of their palm branches, and, and some years we have a donkey, and sometimes the donkey behaves, and sometimes it's an ornery donkey and does what donkeys do. I could make a really bad joke right there, but I'm not going to about this donkey. But there's a really... There was a strong critic of church, especially with the pageantry of Palm Sunday, and one pastor was saying, oh yeah, Palm Sunday is packed, and the critic said, well, of course, because everyone loves a parade. To him, Palm Sunday is just a parade or a procession, but everyone does kind of love a parade. The Rose Bowl Parade and the Macy's Day Parade, I know some of you have had an opportunity to be at one or both of those, or maybe you're like me and you watch it on TV every year. There's all kinds of parades. I remember when our girls were little, and they were really into that princess thing. They just loved to dress up like princesses. We, we made their entire life up to that point when we, when we took them to Disney World and they got to eat lunch in the castle with the princesses. And, and they have a parade on Main Street there at Disney World. And, and boy, our youngest was so excited when Goofy came over and just put his entire mouth over her head. I thought she was going to freak out, but she really, she really liked it. My favorite parades were the ones when the girls were about that age. At the elementary school that they went to, all the children of the school would dress up and they would have a parade, not just through the hallways of the school, but outside and around the block. And the block would be filled with parents and older siblings and grandparents or just simply curious people who just maybe don't get to see children or hear the laughter of children anymore and just wanted to come out and witness this, this parade. Pastor Andrew said, isn't it interesting that 
The team from Milwaukee that came in second place in 1982 had a big kind of procession parade, and the team that actually won in 1971 got squadoosh, nothing, but parades, parades. I was sharing with Neil this parade talk, and, and boy, Neil has never sounded more country in his life to me when then he said, oh yeah, my favorite parade is the Shaler Parade. Shaler Parade. See, he's still excited about it. And Shaler, according to the 2010 census, had a population of 772. But it's known as what, Neil? The popcorn capital of the world. How about that? That's like a big ball of yarn out there in the middle of nowhere. But, but this little town had a three-hour parade that had free popcorn all up. And, and if this doesn't sound Iowa, I don't know what does. There were pork burgers at the end of the parade. Everyone loves a parade. But maybe the biggest parade that Milwaukee's ever known happened in April of 1951. And I know some of the members of this church were a part of it because all of school was canceled. Most of the businesses were canceled. It was when uh, General MacArthur came to Milwaukee. And we have a picture of this event. They estimate that more than a million people lined the streets uh, to be a part of this, this motorcade. And this was the big event where he was going to receive an honorary uh, degree from Marquette University. And does anyone know where that big event took place? The Marquette football field at 35th and St. Paul. Yes, Marquette used to have a football team and they beat the Badgers uh, with some regularity. But when we think about this parade, we do love parades to celebrate, but this parade maybe wouldn't have happened if it weren't for one individual, and I want to acknowledge that the month of March is almost done, and March is Women's History Month, and there was one woman who taught for 40 years. She was the head of the history department at Milwaukee's West Side High School, which is now where the School for the Arts is, and her name was Gertrude Hull. You see, MacArthur wanted to get into West Point, and he was having no luck, and so MacArthur's mom moved he and her into a, a place that is right now where, right across from Riverside Theater, and he would walk two miles up, and she would tutor him, and he had the highest score and got in, and the rest, they say, is history. But today, we celebrate, we remember, hopefully we're convicted by an entirely different kind of parade and or procession. And it's a parade or procession that took place exactly the way the prophet Zechariah said it would be. Zechariah said this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble in riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. What a wonderful image, a man of peace and love, a man whose presence changed the world forever, the way it will ever be. But we know that there's two reasons why people have parades or why there is processions. In some cases, it is pure celebration, but in other cases, it is a show of force, a show of force. We've all probably seen the images of Hitler's Nazi party marching in perfect formation. And again, I know I've talked a lot about my little girls who aren't so little anymore, but you know, when you watch The Lion King, the animated version, the hyenas, their marching is very much like Hitler's. A display of power, a display of force. And what I read just about every year, just about every year I read a book that came out in 2006, by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan called The Last Week. And in their book, they talk about on that day, maybe likely the very same day, sometime around the year 30 AD, there were two different parades, two different processions that were coming into Jerusalem. Now, of course, we pay attention to the one that really the journey began way up north in Galilee and worked its way down this procession, this parade that comes in on a humble donkey, one that has never, ever been ridden before, pure and pristine. 
We celebrate the one of, of these peasants who were, on our, who were excited about some, something that was going to change in the world. They didn't quite understand what it was going to be yet, but they wanted to be a part of it, and they are shouting, Hosanna, as he rides in. So excited are they that they, they take down leaves, palm shoots, and they place them in the street. Not only that, they take off their garments, and they basically roll out the red carpet that this one who they are saying, save us, save now, Hosanna, using king imagery, rides on. But on the other side of Jerusalem, there was an annual procession. You see, this was a time where Jerusalem's numbers were starting to swell. It was the Passover, and people were coming over, faithful uh, pilgrims from all over were uh, converging on the city, and yet the ruler we know him as Pontius Pilate, the governor of that area, once a year would leave his quote-unquote beach house up there at Caesarea by the sea and would come into Jerusalem. He wasn't on a humble foal or a coat, a colt, a donkey. No, instead he had chariots, war horses, There was a display of arms. There was this mighty power force, a display of power reminding the people of Jerusalem, you better behave this year because if not, at any time, we can do away with you in ways you don't even want to imagine. One was a peasant procession. One was an imperial procession. One proclaimed the kingdom of God love and grace, and the other proclaimed the power of the emperor. But there was something else about these two, these two processions, these two parades, and it was about theology. One was talking about, you know, God's chosen coming through. The other was, was not that at all, because the other was this Roman government, and they believed the only God was Caesar, Caesar. And there would be no other gods tolerated. And so these two processions converge right there, just outside of Jerusalem in the city, in what was God's people's most holy time of the year. One of my favorite preachers and writers, John Buchanan, once said, There is no occasion quite like it in terms of contrasting emotions. We love the festivity of it all. We love the idea, or at least I always have, says Buchanan, that Jesus himself enjoyed this day, felt affirmed by the adulation of the crowds, had at least this one moment of victory as the crowds shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But I'm not sure I agree with Buchanan on that. I mean, what do you think? Do you think as Jesus was riding into the city, and again, all this takes place outside the city, do you think that as he was riding over those palm branches, those palm shoots, and the the cloaks, the garments of, of these people, of God's people, and listening to the shouts of Hosanna, the yay Jesus kind of shouts, do you think he really was smiling? Do you think he was enjoying himself? I mean, I've been on a float in a parade and, and did the wave. I was having a ball a time in my life. But was Jesus? Or was Jesus maybe fighting back a tear? Or, or maybe was his heart breaking because he knew what we know, because we know the end of the story, that Jesus knew where this was ultimately going to lead, where this would ultimately end up. He knew probably that those shouts of Hosanna, these ancient words crying out for God to save us, save now, were going to be replaced with shouts of hatred. That these cheers of an incoming champion are going to be replaced with jeers of one they want to get rid of. I mean, we know how the story ends, how five days later, yes, this cheering crowd will have disappeared and changed into a jeering mob, how the hosannas turn to crucifixion, how those palm branches are replaced with lashes, with nails. We know that he's not going to have a royal crown. Instead, he's going to have a crown of thorns. 
I read in the Christian Century over these last couple of weeks, uh, something that, that really speaks to the pomp and circumstance of Palm Sunday. We, friends, cannot forget where it is heading, that the adoring throng with all of the cheering quickly become people that are a jeering mob, a jeering mob. We prefer to think of Jesus not doing this kind of thing. We, we like Jesus when he, is, when he is healing people. We like Jesus when he is curing people. We like Jesus when he's, he's just feeding everyone. We really like Jesus when he turns ordinary water into some really fine wine. But we don't like everything else that comes with it, that comes with it. How quickly in our human condition can all of our shouts of hallelujah on a Sunday turn into something completely different when we're doing a, a deal at work or when we're having a strained relationship with somebody that we are called to love. Yes, there are times where we feel compelled to lay down our garments so that the, the donkey might ride over them, and yet a few days later we can all just flip the switch and want to give Jesus a dry cleaning bill for the stains of the hooves. What is it about us that has us in this place? Yes, we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. So it's almost impossible for us to imagine that we might have been a part of that Good Friday crowd shouting those, those words of crucifixion. No, no, that's not us. Those are those people. But friends, it can, it has been, and is all of us. We are all a part of this. We all have the humanness in us that can lead us to doing these, these things. And we know that his disciples, as they were walking alongside, they probably were really enjoying it. But we know before the week's out, they're going to make themselves very scarce as the heat gets turned up. So rather than generalizing that Good Friday crowd to include all of Israel, I think we need to realize, to universalize it, to realize that we all, all of humanity is encompassed in that Good Friday crowd. Whether our sins are great or small, intentional or unintentional, we are all of us standing in the need of the true ministry of this king, the kind of king that whether cheering or jeering had a mission and there was nothing that was going to keep him from fulfilling it for all of humanity. This one who, even while they were nailing him, prayed that God would forgive them because he honestly believed they didn't understand the big picture yet, but ultimately they would. And so, friends, yes, today's palms are next year's ashes. Today's palms our next year's ashes. Today we celebrate, and it is right for us to celebrate. It is right for us to shout Hosanna, but we know how quickly things are going to change. So thanks be to God that we worship the one, that this, the one that we worship has a great purpose, and that purpose is to save the world of sinners, even the ones who turn on him. We give thanks that he comes in the name of the heavenly parent, the creator of everything that is we give thanks that he chose to be humble and ride upon a donkey instead of a horse of war. And yes, we give thanks, ultimately, that Palm Sunday will give way to Good Friday because we can give thanks to our God that this one, this one that is being proclaimed king is the one and the only one who can reconcile the gap between God and humankind he is the one and the only one who can heal and forgive and redeem. He is the one and the only one who will be forsaken on the cross and yet who will never forsake us in return. And to that, friends, I say praise be to God because that is great good news. Amen. Amen. And so I invite our musicians to, to gather again, and I invite you to stand as you are willing and able, and please allow this musical number, this musical offering, to touch you in your heart and in your soul.
And so it's good that we stood for that because we're going to have to decide which procession we're going to stand up for, acknowledging fully that we, each of us, have the capability to stand for, for both. But may our shouts be shouts of Hosanna. Save us, save now. And when we gather back together again next Sunday, what a celebration it's going to be. But I hope that that haunting peace stays with you as you depart from here this day. Yes, you have your palm branches. But let's truly make this a holy week. Every day at 12 noon, we're going to have a 15-minute devotion online. Maybe some of you are going to be able, over a lunch break, to, to just sit down and take those 15 minutes to hear this devotion, or maybe you'll watch it later at night. Maybe it'll be the last thing that you do before you turn the lights off and go to sleep. On Wednesday, our lectionary Zoom study is on if you want to continue to wrestle with these texts. But then Thursday at 7 o'clock at night, we're going to remember the upper room, remember the Lord's Supper, have a stripping of the sanctuary. That service is at 7. And then on Friday at 12 noon, Good Friday service. Saturday is a day of waiting, it's a day of vigil, and we'll have a service here at 5 o'clock on Saturday to prepare us for the true celebration on Sunday morning. I invite you to register for your attendance, especially for next Sunday if you want to worship with us um, on site. But if you're uncomfortable coming into the building, we're going to have a half-hour worship service out at Clody Park. You'll, you'll find us, and we're going to do that so that those who want to gather with some others but don't want to do it inside the building, that there's still an option for you. But at 9 o'clock and at 10.30, we'll have our two sanctuary services, and what a day of rejoicing it'll be. May God bless all of you and all of you this week as you seek to live the life that Christ calls us to live. Amen.